Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church. And one of the many wonderful aspects of Christianity is the daily grace that Yahweh gives to his children. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve, but Yahweh in his great love gives it to us anyway. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So we're going to be talking about grace today, but we're going to be calling it what the world calls it, and the world talks about it as being given a second chance. And that's the title of the message today. And if you see the screen, it says, Every day is a second chance. The Lord's mercy is new every morning, and when you wake up, you get another chance to start all over again. Well, today we're going to look at a man of God that really blew it and needed God to give him a second chance. His name was Simon, but Jesus saw great strength in him and named him Peter, which means a rock. Well, we're going to see that there is a flaw in that rock, just like in most rocks, there is a flaw that got him into a lot of trouble. We know that Jesus had named him Rock because of a, uh, the word of God tells us in John 1, 40 through 42, that Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, uh, heard John the Baptist say, uh, proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew was looking for the promised Messiah, and when he heard John the Baptist say that, he followed Jesus home that day, and he saw that Jesus was the real deal. And the first thing that Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. Just like any good brother would do, he had good news and he shared it right away with his brother. And you know, that should be our response too. When we find the Lord Jesus Christ and we begin to enjoy the blessings and the gifts that come with knowing him, we should immediately be thinking about how many people we can tell about this wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus. And so he brought him to Jesus. Not only did he tell him about Jesus, but he brought him to Jesus. Again, that's something we should all do. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which is translated a rock, or Peter, or a rock. Well, Peter loved the Lord, and he wanted to do what was right. And he even showed signs of early promise when he, when he and the other disciples were out in a large storm in a small fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee. And I think this picture does it justice, too. I was on the Sea of Galilee. It's about the size of one of our great lakes. And Jesus was not in the boat with them, and they got caught in a huge storm. Well, Matthew 14, 25 through 30, that's now on the screen, tells us during the fourth watch of the night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, they're out in this big storm, and it's dark, and it's black. But all of a sudden, here comes Jesus walking along out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, it says they were terrified, and they said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Well, if you've heard me for any amount of time, you know that this phrase just gets repeated over and over again by Jesus, about his, by his prophets, by his angels. God's always telling us not to fear the circumstances in this world. But if you were ever going to be afraid, if you'd have been in that boat, you would have been afraid. 
all the disciples were scared stiff, and you would have been also if you had been in that boat with them. Now Peter is going to do something completely unexpected that none of us would have ever even thought of. He says to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Well, Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, so he decided that Jesus, with Jesus' help, he could do the same. And in verse 29, Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. Well, this took great courage. None of the other disciples were attempted, I don't believe, for one minute to join him in his walk. Peter's, and at this point it says he began to look, he looked at Jesus. He came toward Jesus. And his whole focus was the Lord Jesus. But then the next verse, it tells us, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Well, he began to saw, see the effects of the wind, and he took his focus off Jesus and put it on the winds and the waves and the circumstances. By the way, uh, when you're already walking on the water in the midst of a storm, but uh, apparently he just, he got his eyes, he was so distracted off Jesus that he, that he began to fail. And it says when he began to lose faith, he began to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. Well, here again, he made this, this uh, impetuous decision and Jesus had to save him. But you know what? He had the courage to step out of the boat, and I think Jesus honored him for that. And Jesus grabbed his hand and put him in the boat. Yeah, you know, we could all question Peter's faith. You know, why didn't he just keep his eyes on Jesus? But boy, you know, it's hard when you're in the midst of the storm. It's so easy for us to get our eyes off on other things. But the thing we want to see here again is that Peter showed that he was a leader, not a follower. He didn't wait for anybody else to get out of the boat. And, but he also showed he had a lot to learn yet. And you know, this might be a good time for us to reflect just on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, what, what Peter had learned here, to learn from his experience, what we can learn from it when you're in a storm, Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Don't to be watching the circumstances too much. Uh, keep your eyes on Jesus and he'll stop you from sinking. So that's a good thing to remember. Well, sometime later in the Lord's ministry, as we're going to keep continuing to look at the interaction between Jesus and Peter, we go down here to Luke 22:31, quite a bit later in Jesus' ministry, and Jesus has given Peter another specific caution. It's right directly to Peter. And in verse Luke 22, 31 through 32, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Kind of interesting that he called him Simon. He didn't call him Peter at that time, which means rock. But he said, Satan, you know, not some lesser demon or, you know, once in a while we think, we say the devil is after us. Well, we're not big enough to uh, <laughs> pray for, the, you know, the main, Satan is the main demonic force. Uh, we might have some little demon spirits chasing after us. But Satan himself has permission to severely test Peter. And we can see that because Peter was the leader and the devil will always go after someone who's leading because if he can take out the leader, he can sometimes really take out the followers as well. And here's this little group that's going to end up turning the world upside down and the devil really is coming after him. Well, when you sift wheat, though, one of the things we need to realize is that you are removing the impurities in it. And the devil wanted to destroy Peter, Peter uh, the devil always wants to destroy all of us, but God was, Jesus was going to stop him before he destroyed Peter, but he was going to let him sift him a little bit, and uh, we need to see that as well. And then the next verse, really important, 
But Jesus, being just a human at that point, God in human form said, but I have prayed for you, Simon. You know, one of the most powerful things we can do when the devil is after us is pray or have other people pray for us. Simon, that your faith may not fail, that your faith is going to carry you through this ordeal. And then he says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Well, Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail. He knew that he was going to head in the wrong direction. And he knew that how severe the trial was that was ahead. But he also knew the ultimate outcome. And that's why he said, strengthen your brothers. When you have returned back, when you've gone back, strengthen your brothers. He strengthened the other apostles. There again, Jesus recognized his leadership. Well, with that background information, we're going to go a little further on, quite a bit further on, toward the end of Jesus' ministry, right before they're going to be going out into the garden, and the next day Jesus will be tried and killed uh, uh, in a Roman's, uh, on a Roman's cross. So it's just a few short hours away from that, and Jesus is about to tell them something that would be very disturbing to them. He says this, in Mark 14, 27 through 31, you will all fall away. That's a pretty clear statement. You will all fall away, Jesus told him, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Well, he tells them clearly so that they know what's coming. You're going to, you're going to, I'm going to be struck and you guys are going to be shattered. And uh, by the way, this was pretty, probably pretty scary for them to hear because Jesus usually, well, he always knew what he was talking about. But the reason Jesus knew this is because it was already prophesied 500 years before in Zechariah, and Jesus quoted it for word for word. But then in verse 28, he says, but after I have risen, you know, Jesus keeps telling him, I'm going to rise from the tomb. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise. I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And we're going to see where he does that later on. And then Peter declared something, even if all fall away, I will not. Peter's pride in himself and his ability he is literally contradicting Jesus. Jesus said, you're going to fall away. He says, no, 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 no. Even if all the other ones fall away, I will not fall away. Peter was so sure of his love for Jesus that he thought he could never fall. But Jesus knew better. So in the next verse 30, Jesus tells them, I tell you the truth. Now, by the way, when Jesus told you, said that, you could really take it to the bank. This is something important and absolutely true. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yet tonight before the rooster crows uh, twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Well, when he's talking yet today, he's talking within the next couple of hours. It, literally, it's going to be about four or five hours after Peter makes this, this declaration that he is going to end up betraying Jesus. And Jesus, being the Son of God, even knew how many times he said, before the, uh, the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. But, here's Peter again, but Peter insisted emphatically, oh, absolutely not, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. The Apostle Paul said, I, I, I will never disown you. You know, one thing I learned some years ago, never and always are two words that should be reserved for God. Whenever we start using always or never, it's going to end up fall, coming back into our face. And then you notice, too, it said, and the others said the same. They were all so sure that they would not renounce Jesus. And there's Peter leading the pack again. He's sure, so they're sure, too. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, now on the screen, tells us this. So if you think you are standing firm... Be careful that you do not fall. 
Well, we need to all realize that, that when you think you, it can't happen to you, that you're on some pretty shaky ground. Well, I mean right immediately after this, uh, the disciples went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and in the garden, Jesus warns Peter and the rest of his disciples again not to trust in their own selves, but instead to put their faith in God and to pray to God for help. In Matthew uh, 26, 41, it says, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I'm going to repeat that because it's so important. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. If you're anything like me, you wake up in the morning, you got all kinds of wonderful intentions of doing wonderful things for God, but as the day goes on, you begin to tire, get tired, and toward the evening, you start even getting a little grumpy, and you, become, you, you start looking for the easy way out and all these things. And so this is, we're going to see that this is going to happen. Well, right after this, immediately after he tells them this, Judas appears with the mob, and they arrest Jesus, and he's taken to the high priest's house in the middle of the night for a trial, which, by the way, was against the law. But they did it anyway. And at Jesus' arrest, when he was arrested, Peter fled with all the rest of the disciples, just as Jesus had said, you will all fall away. But then later, with the Apostle Paul, he returns, he probably, his conscience started to bother him, and he returns and follows the mob from a distance right into the courtyard where Jesus is being held, waiting for the Sanhedrin to get together so they could pretend to have a fair trial. And this is where we get to the next part here in Mark 14, 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the, of the high priest came by. Not some big fully armed Roman soldier or anything, but a servant girl came by. Came by. And uh, so verse 67 said, when she saw, see, saw Peter warming herself, she looked closely at him. You also were, that were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. Well, here's Peter. He's warming himself by the fire. He's trying to be more comfortable, which is what we do. We, we, we're we're fra frail human beings. And uh, remember that Jesus had warned him, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so she, she comes by and uh, she looks closely at him and probably could do that because he's real close to the fire and the glow from the fire. She can see his face. And uh, she said, you were with that Nazarene Jesus. And uh, the next verse says, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you are talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. That was the first denial. But it's that same, same servant girl, but now, you know, he's come goes where the entrance is so he can make a quick, quick exit if he needs to. And then, uh, so he goes out in the entryway. Then the next verse said, When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Uh, this fellow, she's insinuating, should be arrested and tried as well, guilt by association, which seems to be a lot of that going around now. Verse 70, again, he denied it. Denial number two. And after a little while, those standing near to Peter says, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Well, Galilee was in the north of Israel, and... Uh, that's where Jesus spent most of his time. And just like sometimes we can tell people from the east, from Boston by their language or, their, or, or from the south, maybe they got a cowboy hat on or something, and we realize they're not from around here. He, he, he realized that, that he was a Galilean. In verse 71, this is very painful even to think about, he began to call down curses on himself. Fear will make you do foolish things. And he swore to them. He swore. He wanted an oath. 
I don't know this man that you're talking about. And this was the third time that Peter had denied Jesus. It was a complete denial of his relationship with Jesus. Verse 72 tells us, Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. The very instant, not some time later, but that very moment that rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And you know, Luke 22, not on the screen, tells us something is really important. And here is Peter there, and Jesus turns and looks straight at Peter, and their eyes meet. Wow, what a moment that must have been for Peter and, and for Jesus, I guess. And it says, and he broke down and wept. Here's the rock being crushed. He had betrayed so, Jesus so quickly. He broke down and wept. The rock now is weeping. And uh, remember that Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, here Peter is, and, and he has gotten away from God's will. And by the way, I, I think about this a lot of times. You know, I don't know if it's accident or it was God's intention to do this, but when we crow, there's another, you know, the word crow is what a rooster does, but it also has another meaning. It means a person who gloats or boasts beyond their true ability. Did Peter realize that he had crowed when he said that even if all the others would leave Jesus, he would not? Well, I guess the question now is, is there a limit of what God can forgive? We all wonder, did, have we ever, many times we think, have we passed that limit? Peter's denied Jesus three times. Was the rock finished? Was his ministry all over? Had he committed a sin so horrible that he could never be forgiven? Well, we're going to see as we finish the rest of this message. In John 21, 1 through 5, it says, Afterwards, afterwards, what's this? After Jesus' cruel trial, crucifixion and death, and his resurrection on the third day, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. Here's Jesus. These disciples have all fled from him. They, they, even after he warned them, they had run away from him. And here he is reaching out to them. And it says he was by the Sea of Tiberias, but by the way, that was the name that the Romans called the Sea of Galilee. Remember he said earlier, I'll meet you at the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has this all under control. He knew everything that was going to happen. And then it says it happened this way. Well, here's Simon Peter and all the other disciples, and they're all there. there. And Simon Peter, none of this is on the screen, it says, I'm going out to fish. But we need to remember, and the other disciples said, we'll go with you. But we need to remember that Jesus had told Peter that I, you will no longer be fishermen, but I will make you fishers of men. And here Peter is leading them back to being fishers, fishermen again instead of being fishers of men. And so they went out and they caught nothing all night, it tells us, and they were professional fishermen. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? And they said, no. And he said, he invited them to have breakfast with, them, with him. And in verse 21, 15 through 17, it says, and when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now he, he, you know, here's another meal with the disciples after the resurrection, right there in the room with them. He speaks specifically to Peter, and he said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And, you know, he had asked him that because Simon had said that he loved Jesus more than any of them, and he'd never fail him. And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Take care of my other young followers who are not as strong as you. And then Jesus says again, and Jesus said again, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? 
Do you wholeheartedly love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you, Peter said. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Be a leader to the whole flock. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time and he knew that he had, he had uh, uh, denied Jesus three times. Now here Jesus is giving him the opportunity to redeem himself and to speak positively of their relationship. And again, but it broke his heart, but he said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. So provide, this, provide the spiritual food that my people need. And you know what? What are we learning from all this? Jesus will give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance. Remember Lamentation says that his mercy is new every morning. Our God is and every day is another chance to serve and worship the Lord. And if you blew it and you thought you were a rock and you thought you'd never fail and you thought you'd always follow Jesus and, and you've made some mistakes and you've gotten off course, uh, you remember that Jesus reached out to Peter and he is reaching out to you today. If you've gotten away from God, this, today, this moment's the very moment to start getting back to the Lord Isaiah 1.18, not on the screen, says, Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be made as white as snow. When we accept Jesus as our Lord, or when we repent and we come back to the Lord, it's like there's a big chalkboard with all of our sins written on them, and he takes a great big giant eraser and he just erases it all out. And you know, in Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I, blot out your transgression for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Well, when you come in to this remarkable relationship with Jesus, either for the first time or when you repent and come back, you receive this wonderful gift of a second chance. So I'm just asking you today to, to make that decision today to either accept Jesus for the first time or to repent and return to him. And you will be blessed. And God bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.